Okay. So we were talking about building community. This is my community, groups that have helped uh, get our technologies out into the world. And this is also my conflict of interest, and thank you slide. Uh, I thought we could take a moment of silent reflection on the loss of 100 centenarian genomes and $16 million for research almost exactly a year from today, a year ago. Uh, if you want to know more about it, you can do a Google search of AGXP or, or XPRIZE in public debate. Time's up. Um, but here's the star. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to just a, a few slides on epigenome analysis. We have an exciting new sequencing method. And then most of it's going to be on epigenome engineering. And you'll see why I think that's an interesting complement to most of uh, what we'll be talking about here today. So first, epigenome analysis. In particular, analyzing the 3D uh, disposition of RNAs within uh, tissue uh, samples, sections, and so forth. Um, we would really like to be able to read out uh, what the genome is uh, playing out in this epigenomic state uh, at, at high resolution and uh, with full comprehensiveness that we expect of RNA sequencing, for those of you who know that. So what we do is we take this little cube of tissue here and uh, where each dot is a single RNA or in principle protein or DNA molecule, but for now RNA, and uh, we make cDNA and then um, fluorescently sequence it, just like next-gen sequencing. In fact, this is one of the reasons that we developed next-gen sequencing back in the late 90s, and, uh, and almost any fluorescent uh, next-gen sequencing will work for this. We have you tended to use li ligation, but the uh, polymerase works as well. Now this produces a very dense amount of information. Instead of having that normally when you, take, when you do RNA analysis, you'll take the RNAs out of the tissue, you'll randomly distribute them on a slide, and then you'll read them there. You've lost all the three-dimensional information. In this case, we just said, why not read them where they are? You get the quantitative information, same quantitative information by counting, but you also get the X, Y, and Z coordinates, which are meaningful. You want to do this as high resolution as possible, so you maximize the number of RNA sequences you get per slide or per experiment. And also, it's a little crowded in there. So we have four methods that we have uh, worked on that are all working well. Uh, one is thin sections. I think the first two are fairly obvious. Deconvolution is a computational method. Um, down below, at the bottom of the slide, we saw super, super resolution, which allows us to get down to 10 nanometers from 400 to kind of a typical resolution. And what you can see here is this in white is the sort of typical resolution pixelated, so we've blown it up so you can actually see the pixels. That would be the resolution of this image. And then this little square here is blown up to show the resolution we see as super resolution. So when we say that it's 40 times higher resolution, we really mean it. And this particular image was taken from Ting Wu, a professor at uh, Harvard uh, Medical School, Department of Genetics. Now, that's, that's one method of getting it, uh, which is super resolution. But we can actually even read multiple RNAs in the same voxel. No matter how tiny that voxel is, no matter how high, how high the resolution, we can get more than one sequence from that. And we do this by a trick called molecular stratification. In this case, we will read a subset of the messenger RNAs by selective priming or selective sequencing. And then we can go back and get a different subset by using a different set of primers. So for example, you can see here down at the bottom how much cleaner the signal is by getting a subset than it is by getting, uh, using random prime with all possible uh, uh, sigmas. Here we take a subset which is uh, reduced by 16-fold. So improvement in, uh, in quality, and, uh, and, but we still can get uh, the same ultimate number of RNAs identified. And this is the last slide on this, on this series showing an example of one messenger RNA taken out from uh, some of these fluorescent in situ sequencing, such as the one I showed in the previous slide, but looking at multiple reads uh, that you obtain for this particular long messenger RNA, which is 8 kb long, which is fibronectin. And this is in a wound healing um, model system uh, for using human fibroblasts and show under here under two different growth conditions and along the x-axis is this 8 kb transcript and then it's a histogram showing 
the reads, individual mo single molecule RNA sequence reads that we identify by matching it to the transcriptome. And you can see a little gap here, uh, which could be that we were missing that data artifactually, or it could be that it's alternative splicing. It turned out it was the latter, because when we changed the media, um, uh, and, uh, and there's a variety of other experiments that show that this is a physiologically meaningful change from uh, fetal bovine ser serum to epidermal growth factor in the wound healing paradigm, we now have this alternative exon number 25 from fibronectin shows up in our in situ sequences. And remember, we're getting the 3D coordinates of this in the tissue as well as the quantitation. So that's all I'm going to say about uh, epigenome analysis. It'll be clear that we use this and these and other tools when we're doing epigenome engineering. But I want, uh, you know, I want you all to be thinking of questions because hopefully this is going to uh, leave time for questions at the end. We need cohorts uh, for, for this uh, sort of study, and uh, we've got a terrific one that's completely open access. It's the only one in the world that we know of that allows integration of genomes, environment, and trait data. Um, this has been uh, adopted by a uh, unique collaboration between us and, the, and, and, and also collaboration between NIST and uh, the National Institute of Standard Technology and the Food and Drug Administration for shareable standards for genomes and for cells. And, uh, uh, and this cohort is also uh, kind of a front runner for uh, sharing of data for testing of uh, genome interpretation, and it, it also uh, figures into uh, a wish for individuals participating in research studies as well as medicine in, in general to be able to download their own data as now implemented by the U.S. government called Blue Button. Now, some people give up hope when they talk about uh, multigenic traits or complex diseases or, uh, and of course, aging is the most multigenic trait of all, and we all have it. We all die from it, probably. Uh, but there's no reason to give up hope. Uh, I think that the, it depends on the tools that you use. And the tools that, that have been uh, focused on the most, I think, are, are inappropriate for certain uh, things. They're, they have their uses. For example, genome-wide association study, you might take a quantitative trait like height, and you get a nice bell curve, and you spend and you have cohort sizes that are gigantic, in this case up to 200,000 people, and you find uh, 700 genes that impact, you know, maybe a millimeter each in height, and you say, how could we possibly, and each have variance and, and variation and, and environmental components, so how could we possibly diagnose height from a genome, much less cure it? Um, I'm, some of you are wondering why I want to cure height, but anyway. The point is this is a general, this is a uh, kind of the bleeding edge example of a multigenic trait. And I would say that this is thinking about it in the wrong way. The alternative to this multigenic approach, which is valuable, is uh, looking at a very small number of individuals and a very small number of genes out at the tip of the bell curves, at both ends of the bell curve. There are very interesting things that happen out there. And what you find is that there can be a small number of genes, could be one, could be two in this case, of growth hormone and growth hormone receptor, which explain so much and they uh, provide a therapeutic insight that you don't get from the 700 genes that, apply, that give you a millimeter each. And I think this can be generalized to a variety of other interesting multigenic traits that are involved in age-related diseases. And, I, and I, I'm just throwing that out there as a hypothesis. Uh, and there are a few other examples other than this one. Um, and the fact is that if you, uh, if you have a, a child who is delayed or, or de destined to be uh, short and given uh, growth hormone, even after most of their colleagues have stopped uh, growing, at that age, they will continue to grow past the normal time and will achieve uh, a nearly normal height. So this is epistatic, that is to say it overwhelms all those little effects of 700 genes that you get from studying the middle of the bell curve. The other aspect of, of this small cohort size that occurs out at the extremes, by definition you go far enough out, there's only one person on the planet that has the, this particular uh, um, trait 
uh, constellation. And so we call these N-of-1 studies. And it causes us to change from correlation, where we might need a cohort of 270,000, to uh, focus on causality, which is better anyway. Uh, it, it, it's what we need to, to prove that we are there, and it also moves us towards therapeutics. And you can do causality with either human or animal tests. Here are three animal tests to prove there was an N of one of one individual, this seven-month-year-old, that had a myostatin double null, so it was missing both copies of the gene uh, throughout his body. And, uh, and it had, and the baby came out essentially looking like Arnold Schwarzenegger at his peak, uh, but this was straight out of, uh, at birth without working out. Been, it's been f uh, reproduced in these three animals, and, but you can also do this in humans. And here's an example, something that we just recently published together with uh, William Pooh and Kit Parker's uh, groups, uh, where we had a N of one cohort uh, having a, a, a very early onset cardiomyopathy, and we could use normal cells, in fact, cells from my own skin, to reprogram them both genetically, so they have missing one G that we thought might be causing the disease, so a one G, one base deletion, we pro reprogram them genetically and epigenetically. We reprogram them to be a very or well ordered uh, uh, cardiac tissue, which then uh, reproduces all four of the main traits a little lipid disorder, the, the um, mitochondrial um, uh, morphology, and uh, movement, the cardiac beating. So, one base, we prove that that is necessary and sufficient for the syndrome, and, um, and and it also presumably is necessary and sufficient for fixing it. So the story that I'm kind of building here is that we need to embrace the outliers. The middle of the bell curve is great, but we really want to embrace outliers, and we want to be able to test N of 1 studies uh, genetically and epigenetically. We want to be able to engineer genomes. Now here are four of, uh, of somewhere between 70 and 400 outliers who live past 110 years, and I'm sure you're all aware of this. Uh, if you want to more information, go to supercentenarianstudy.com, where we have, we're well on our way to sequencing most of these uh, individuals. Um, and sequencing, we hope, I think that the statisticians would like to have them all have exactly the same uh, uh, gene change that would cause them all to uh, live so long. I would like them to each have a different genetic change that we can prove in a causal sense and combine them in new combinations that we've never seen before. But biology will be what it will be. By the way, I'm not advocating smoking and drinking to excess or eating sweets. <laughs> so embrace your outliers. Uh, rare, extreme, the rarer and the more extreme, the better. This is now not the outliers uh, in, in the human species, which I was just talking about, but this is, these are outliers that, we've, that we found in a terrific database that if you haven't used already, I encourage you to take a look at. This was developed by a postdoc of mine, uh, João Pedro de Magalhas, um, who's now uh, a professor at Liverpool, and now has expanded to over 4,000 species of, of animals, so it's an animal aging database. And you can see these red uh, diamonds are outliers, ranging um, up to 400 years. And, uh, and the question is, uh, you know, why do some humans live past 120 years? Why do some animals live much longer than nearby animals in the, phylo in the phylogenetic tree? And so we have contributed uh, with, with uh, Pedro's group to um, the transcriptome and the genome of uh, of naked mole rat and the bowhead whale will be coming out uh, very soon uh, for you, those of you who are interested. And we're looking for keys, genes, and gene variants that we can apply in uh, causality studies. We, haven't, uh, we have some examples of rare protective gene variants that I think are of interest in general and, uh, and of interest to uh, diseases of aging. For example, we have alleles of APP, which um, Unlike most alleles of APP, which are either neutral or cause you to get early uh, Alzheimer's, these alleles delay Alzheimer's by a considerable amount. They're considered a protective gene variant. In fact, everything on this list is protective. It's rare, fairly rare and protective. It's not the most common allele. 
Um, there are some that uh, from David Altshuler's group has found that cause a lower risk of type 2 diabetes, lower risk of coronary, uh, two genes involved in lower coronary disease. And again, these are rare alleles in the population. I would like to sign up to get my genome changed to get these. And you've already seen myostatin um, and, and growth hormone. LRP5 causes extra strong bones. Bones are almost unbreakable. This might be an anti-osteoporosis uh, but all of these things will be, there may be some that are specifically involved in a more general mechanism of anti-aging because we know that animals range from day, lifetimes of days to hundreds of years, 400 years. Now I'm just going to briefly show you some icons here. Uh, this is started by Hanahan and Weinberg, this kind of this idea of hallmarks of can cancer and aging um, with a, a half a dozen and then um, um, uh, immune surveillance was added, and Steve Elledge added um, another five, having to do with stress and damage, which was kind of, as Mike said, is kind of a theme at this meeting. That's cancer, but you can see a lot of those are reflected again in aging hallmarks. Um, there are some cases where proliferation works at odds uh, against um, uh, senescence, the senescence and proliferative opposite, and some of them where they seem to be, uh, have common causes or common uh, regulatory mechanisms aligned in the same direction. And finally, hallmarks are kind of analytic and telling you where, where we are, while the seven sins, uh, seven deadly sins, are uh, an effort to try to uh, get at therapeutics um, that and what I want to talk about is slightly different from all those. It, it, it overlaps uh, in interesting ways, but it's about reversal, and not necessarily reversal of damage, but reversal of the epigenetic changes. Not I mean, there's no doubt that there is damage, and uh, we need uh, uh, technologies for addressing them. And I can, um, but this is specifically about epigenetic changes. And here are here are the the, the ration, here's the rationale. Um, Wakayama and colleagues uh, published this lovely paper in 2013 where they showed that over 25 generations of mouse, you can take an adult nucleus, reprogram it back, send it back through the uh, developmental pathway, and the longevity of the mouse essentially stays uh, rock solid uh, with a normal kind of variation um, through all these generations of nuclear transfer cloning. So this is telling you that um, we do not have premature aging or any other defects that everybody seemed to amplify ever since Dolly the sheep uh, uh, occurring in this, and it is quite feasible for mammalian uh, cells that normally would have died uh, in two years or so to go on and on in subsequent generations. This shouldn't surprise us. But there are other paradigms in which the aging clock is reset, and probably the, mo the one we've already introduced is this one where my 60-year-old my cells were reprogrammed from fibroblasts uh, to stem cells and then into differentiated tissues like back to fibroblasts or cardiac. And in that round trip, they, they did not return to a 60-year-old state but to something much younger in general. Now, the fact that a few markers have changed shouldn't uh, be compelling, this transdifferentiation or dedifferentiation. And we'd like to be able to do this with a minimum the lightest touch, we'd like to do it in situ where the nuclei reside without having to take them out and make stem cells or even make stem cells in, vi in vivo. We'd like to just change the nucleus itself. So there are a variety of senescence markers that many people in this room are familiar with, senescence-associated beta-gal, lipofusion, various gene expression. I already showed you fluorescent in situ sequencing as a way of analyzing that in great detail. Telomere length, metabolism, and so on. Two nice... Uh, articles on methylation as a uh, senescence markers. Uh, we work closely with uh, David Sinclair's lab. Uh, he's a professor in, in my department, and he recently published this paper in Cell on um, the decline in these key metabolites, NAD plus and ATP, rescued by an intermediate uh, metabolic uh, precursor to NAD called um, nicotinamide. 
And you, you can see the, this kind of rescue in a variety of experimental uh, paradigms where as little as a two to th three-fold increase in NAD uh, gives you very significant uh, changes in the um, age-related dec decline. And it, many of you may know this, uh, this pathway, uh, but for the purpose of this talk, uh, the, we're going to focus on TFAM, which uh, is, is, is we're taking NMN up here in the upper left, and it feeds in through a CERT1 uh, down into TFAM, which then impacts uh, mitochondria, among many other things. So how are we going to do this? How are we going to do this? So we have a, a new technology um, called CRISPR or Cas9, uh, which, we, which was brought in from a bacterial genome, has now been used in almost every, has been successful in almost every organism it's been tried in, including fungi, plants, and a variety of animals. And in this particular case, CRISPR-Cas9 is usually used for making double-strand breaks, both in nature and also in many experiments. In this case, we're disabling its ability to make cutting and just use it as a DNA binding reagent to which we can bind an activation domain. When we have uh, this integrated into the cell lines, we're, in particular, we're gonna act, we can activate endogenous uh, regulatory mechanisms without actually changing a gene. So if we want to regulate TFAM, we don't have to touch the TFAM gene directly with, with the DNA. We can act at a distance um, by making regulators that bind to the TFAM promoter and, and up-regulate TFAM if we're using an activator, or we could have used a repressor element. And then measure the, the kind of biomarkers I talked about earlier, these biomarkers of aging, and see what happens. So we want to compare uh, biological with chronological age and alter that. And we're doing this with adeno-associated virus um, so that we can do delivery uh, to uh, individual mouse cells or systemically throughout the entire body as would be needed for a reversal of aging in every cell in one's body. So, what we have here is a diagram of CRISPR for those of you who have been hiding under a rock for the last year and a half and have never heard of CRISPR. Um, this is used as a guide RNA in red to, where the DNA is denatured and makes a triple helix. And in this case, we've got these little yellow ball and blue ball means that we have used mutations to, to eliminate the ability to cut. So it doesn't cut anymore, it just binds. And when it binds, it brings along with it an activation domain, BP64. In fact, we now have, and that's, that's one of the world's best activation domains, but we now have in our lab even better ones, but we're just going to focus on this one for this uh, purposes here. And then we can use that to activate any of these um, famous um, genes that might be, you might want to activate and then see the consequences. So we are, uh, in particular, um, trying to uh, re reverse this uh, process of pseudohypoxia that comes from lower NAD or NAD to NADH ratios, and we're doing this um, in, by upregulating TFAM, which is a, a mitochondrial transcription factor, and uh, it regulates uh, mitochondrial copy number, among other things. It's been shown in previous work that it uh, prevents mitochondrial DNA decline. So these are the, the map of where we put the guide RNAs for this experiment. So these are CRISPR guide RNAs. Uh, CRISPR has been tested in many different, this, for the, the cognoscenti in the room that are really following this, this, this is the ST1 type of Cas9. It's not the original one that we published, but a newer one. Um, and you can see uh, an activation of the TFAM by up to 47-fold. Um, these are different guides, so you can see some guides are better than others, so there's a, a reason to both computationally and empirically look for the best guide RNA and then use that therapeutically. So this one is a 47-fold one, and that's the main one we'll focus on in, in, in it coming up, but we'll use, uh, so that's called T2, the T2 guide RNA um, uh, is, is, a, is the one that we'll be focusing on, but we'll use T4 as a control as well as no control. A, a no uh, Cas9 control. So here you can see that not only is the TFAM gene 
product, the RNA, upregulated, but the ATP is as well, um, very, very significantly above the blank or the Cas9 controls. Furthermore, the NAD plus is up, and the ratio of NAD plus to NADH is up quite significantly. And again, T2 is the, is the name of the guide RNA that's, that's guiding, is made in one part of the genome that guides the Cas9, which is a generic activator to a particular target in the TFAM promoter. And so here's the NAD ratio, uh, NAD to NADH ratio of about 7.5. We, we, can, uh, we can look at this in the context of this uh, 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 in, the, in, the, in the context of, of other uh, regulators or other metabolic uh, uh, regulators of, of this phenomenon. And again, we can see a, this huge impact of NAD to NADH ratio. So, we also can measure uh, the impact on uh, mitochondrial mass, which again uh, is uh, dependent on the guide RNA, as we can see here, and, uh, and is also uh, has minimal effect on the reactive ox oxygen species. So I just uh, want to thank in particular here um, Margot Monroe and Bobby Dodwar, who uh, are postdocs in the lab that have really initiated this. Particular study, John Ock, who has been instrumental not only in running the lab, but in computational biology and design of the CRISPR-Cas9 guide RNA, so some of the software for this is available on our website. Um, and uh, many people around the world are using it to design their uh, guide RNAs and CASR. Uh, CRISPR uh, analyses. So um, I left uh, more than enough time for questions, so please, uh, hopefully I've provoked you. Thank you. <laughs>